So Ashokan is a professor in the uh, Cheriton School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. Prior to that, he was a founding director of the Helsinki Alto Center for Information Security. Uh, Ashokan is very well known in the broad system security area. He has published widely and his papers are widely cited. More recently, he has started working on the security and privacy aspects of AI systems, which is a growing concern as AI systems are getting adopted uh, in all kinds of settings. So without any further delay, Ashokan, the online floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead with your talk. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, so I assume everybody can uh, see my screen and hear me. Yeah. Joel, you can switch off your video if that's OK with you. OK, so um, so my talk is uh, um, going to be a little bit uh, different, perhaps. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, confidence in AI systems and, and ask the question, uh, you know, given that AI is so popular and, and widely being widely deployed, uh, to what extent can we trust them? Um, so I'll start by sort of giving a prologue that I'm, I'm sure this audience doesn't need convincing. Look, AI is pervasive. It is already starting to be pervasive and this is only going to accelerate. Here is a chart that shows the North American AI market size and I could have picked any other metric, world market size or the investment or whatever, and all of them will look the same. So not only is the, the uh, uh, extent and, and uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, investment in rapidly increasing, the scope is also increasing. And again, I think for this audience, I, I don't need to, I'll be preaching to the choir. Um, AI is being used in uh, precision medicine, like for personalized medicine. It's being used in, uh, uh, in, in law enforcement. Uh, trying to sort of uh, anticipate uh, uh, and uh, anticipate potential crimes and then police accordingly. Um, it's being used in recruitment uh, to make hiring decisions. And of course, it's also being used to, to uh, widely in uh, cybersecurity for detection and prevention of uh, potential attacks. <clears throat> so we could uh, uh, get, take a step back and say, um, it, it's growing dramatically. It is going to be used in every walk of life. Uh, every profession is going to be impacted. Um, so how do we then decide whether an AI based system is effective? And does that is that consistent with this rapidly increasing popularity? So now, typically, if you look at any AI based system, the, the first thing that people would care about is whether it's effective. And this is captured by measures of accuracy, like, for example, the rate of false positives or the rate of false negatives. So to, to, to use an example, consider some kind of a face recognition scheme that an organization wants to use to authenticate their employees before giving them access to their computer systems. So for a system like that, typically the, the effectiveness would be measured by seeing, for example, you know, if, if I want to log into my account, and every time I present my face, the system should uh, let me log in and not refuse access because it sort of uh, uh, failed to recognize my face. So that will be reducing the number of false negatives. On the other hand, if, I, if Vijay tries to log into my account, then the system should recognize that his face is different from my face and uh, uh, prevent access. It should not accidentally let him access. And if it did that, that would be a false positive. So again, a measure of effectiveness would be to reduce the false positive rate. And if a system has you know, low enough false positive rate and low enough false negative rate, typically an AI designer would declare that as an effective system. So that's one dimension. The other dimension would be performance. You, you of course, want this um, face recognition decisions to happen in real time. It shouldn't take uh, minutes. It should also not use a lot of resources. Um, so typically, this has been how traditionally AI-based systems have been evaluated, and, and, and that was fine for a while. But given that this technology is becoming so pervasive and so widespread, um, this is no longer enough to, to only look at these, uh, uh, these criteria. And the reason for this is that whenever a technology becomes successful, uh, people do all kinds of amazing things with that. It attracts uh, talented people to innovate, but it also attracts uh, um, 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 sort of uh, 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 adversarial actors. 
and people who see that this technology is, uh, is uh, very influential and very profitable and therefore somehow circumvent them to meet their needs. So I argue that a system for a system to be trustworthy when it becomes popular is that it should meet its usual criteria, but in the presence of adversarial behavior. So for example, going back to this uh, face recognition system again, you know, if Vijay wants to uh, uh, log into the system into my account, uh, if he's an adversary, he's not going to oblige by using his face because he knows that the system is good enough to, to have low false positive rate. So he's going to behave adversarially, meaning that uh, you know, he might uh, uh, wear glasses or um, use a makeup or, or, or use a wig or, or some do something that would sort of fool the system into thinking that it is my uh, uh, my face. Um, so, so this is sort of what I want to address, like what can uh, an adversary do and how would, uh, uh, what kind of attacks are possible and, and briefly also what could we do about this. So we could think about sort of security and privacy concerns as a sort of first approximation of what uh, what are the challenges in making AI-based systems trustworthy? And I'm going to give you some examples to motivate, and, and I think many of you who, are, uh, who have been dealing with this area may have already seen this. So the first one is uh, evading, uh, evasion of machine learning model. Um, um, so you, you've probably seen this uh, in, in research papers, but also in popular literature, that uh, image classification models, for example, which are one type of uh, AI model, uh, can be fooled into making the wrong decision. Uh, and this was sort of known already uh, some time ago and with the, uh, when, when deep learning became popular, this started to be a very um, um, interesting uh, academic, uh, uh, a, a, a topic that interests uh, uh, academics a lot. So this, uh, this example is from a paper from um, uh, six or seven years ago about a state-of-the-art image classification system uh, whose job is given an image trying to identify the type of object, the class of objects that are in there. So you know, a, a good uh, classification system given an image like that would, uh, would uh, uh, say that it's a school bus, right? And it turns out that by adding a small amount of noise um, sufficiently scaled down so that the, uh, the resulting picture still looks like a school bus to humans, uh, but a state-of-the-art uh, machine learning model would completely misclassify that and, and do so with high confidence. Uh, so these are called adversarial examples, and adversarial examples are inputs that are slightly modified that remain uh, imperceptible, imperceptible to humans, uh, but can completely uh, uh, misclassify um, uh, cause uh, machine learning models and AI models in general to misbehave. And uh, so when this was first introduced, people thought, okay, this is a curiosity. Um, you know, if, you, uh, if you're in a real system, uh, these adversarial examples will not be so uh, um, robust. Um, they will not survive. Uh, they will not continue to fool a system subject to the image being you know, zoomed in or zoomed out or turned and so on. Uh, but quickly, this turned out to be not the case. So here's another example. Again, uh, the, uh, like without the presence of an adversary, this would be classified as a cat. And, uh, and the people uh, in this paper, which was published a couple of years ago, showed that uh, even when you subject this image to all kinds of transformations, like zooming in and so on, um, the system would sort of continuously uh, misclassify. So this is an animation that shows this. So initially, uh, with small changes, it, it uh, classifies these as something like a desktop computer or something similar. But watch that even when you uh, uh, um, apply transformations like twisting and turning and zooming in, uh, the model continues to believe that it's a, a misclassification. So these are the different classes, and you see that quite often, despite all those transformations, the class desktop computer is uh, um, is the sort of a, uh, uh, the machine learning models thinks that is a desktop, desktop computer with high confidence, the, the height of this corresponds to the confidence. Um, and this is not only for image classification model, uh, this kind of adversarial examples have been also shown for uh, other types of uh, AI models. So here is an example for um, uh, voice recognition system like, like Siri or 
um, Alexa. And uh, um, what, um, what this shows is, um, let me put this in a, um, somewhere in the middle. Um, so uh, normally you can uh, give a voice command to an iPhone and iPhone will dial that number. And so this is what happens. What the researchers then do is uh, lock the phone and then generate an ultrasound sequence. And uh, hu humans can't hear that, but watch that Siri is going to be fooled into thinking that a human is uh, calling out the number. So now there's an ultrasound animation and, and the phone starts dialing this number. So, so these are examples of uh, 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 evasion. And evasion is only one kind of a problem. So I'm going to argue that uh, if you systematically think about machine learning as a, as a sort of a, a, a pipeline, a process, there are different parties are involved and there are different assets that each party cares about. And by systematically asking these uh, questions like, you know, who is the potential adversary? What is the adversary's target? We'll be able to uh, identify um, all the potential security and privacy concerns. So the, the typical machine learning pipeline consists of you know, some people who have data, they contribute data to a data set. Uh, uh, an analyst then uses some trainer software, possibly from with some libraries that, that have been you know, written by others, uh, uses use this trainer software with those libraries on the data set to train a machine learning model. And then the machine learning model is usually made available to the client um, you know, either directly or more, more often via uh, uh, an interface, a prediction service API. And quite often the machine learning model itself might reside in some, some cloud service and there may be an appropriate firewall in front so that the client is only access allowed to uh, interact with the machine learning model via this restrictive API. And so with a setup like this, then you can ask this question like, who, who is the adversary? Because there are different parties like the client, the, the service provider, the analyst who trains the model, the people who write software that's used by the analyst, the data owners who contribute data. And you can ask this question systematically. Who is the adversary? What is the adversary's target? So in the next few slides, I will sort of indicate the adversary in red and the adversary's target in blue. And we can see that there are um, this, this sort of uh, teases out different types of uh, uh, security and privacy problems in, in machine learning specifically and AI more generally. So the first one is what we saw earlier, that there is a client and then somebody on the client side is the adversary. And what the adversary manipulates is this input, right, by adding noise to the input, for example. And the goal of the adversary, the, the asset that he wants to, that the adversary wants to compromise is actually the output. So the adversary want to um, fool the machine learning model into providing the wrong output. So we saw some examples and you might think that those are images and audio, they're not so serious, but imagine that there is like a autonomous driving uh, uh, model, um, like an autonomous driving system that has a, a image recognition model as part of the, the driver software. And, and, and one of the jobs of this, uh, uh, this recognition model is to look at uh, images of traffic signs and then interpret them correctly. So if you, if you see a stop sign, we should recognize that as a stop sign. Uh, and uh, uh, adversarial example in this case would mean slightly manipulating this uh, stop sign so that for humans it still looks like a stop sign, but the machine learning model will uh, misinterpret this as, for example, a, a speed limit sign or a left turn sign. And you can see that these are potentially um, safety considerations, right? So if, uh, if this can happen in a real system, that can cause uh, damage. Uh, so that's that's the example that we saw. This is model evasion. So going forward, I'm going to link to some papers that uh, uh, um, uh, deal with this particular uh, attack that I'm talking about in a, in, in a given slide. Um, you can find these slides uh, on my homepage. If you Google for my name, you'll find my homepage. They are already there. So if you want, you can uh, um, want to delve deeper. You can go look at these uh, individual references. So a second uh, attack uh, that can happen, again, if in the case of a malicious client, but the malicious client is not interested in, uh, um, not necessarily interested in fooling the model, 
but wants to learn some information about the training data that was used to train the model, right? So this is an attack against the privacy of training data. And this is again a concern, right? People provide data to, uh, uh, you know, data is very important to train AI models. Uh, people may provide either voluntarily or for a payment, uh, but under the impression that the data would be used to train a machine learning model and uh, nobody will be able to misuse the data for other purposes. Now, if a malicious client can learn something about who contributed what data, that constitutes a breach of privacy. And uh, how can the uh, malicious client do this? Again, because they have access to a, a prediction API, so they can make uh, repeated queries, uh, perhaps adaptively, so depending on the result of one query, they can decide what the next query is. And by doing so, they can try to infer some information about the, the data set itself. And, and at some high level, this is sort of natural because you know, machine learning models uh, reveal some information with each response to every legitimate query. And uh, by, by carefully constructing these queries, uh, the, the uh, a malicious client may be able to learn information. And this, uh, this is in fact has been shown that um, uh, one can infer membership, so you can say if a particular person's data was included in the training model, you can also invert the model, meaning that you can try to get some kind of average representation of, uh, uh, of a given class recognized by a machine learning model. So going back to this face recognition example, if there is a, a face recognition model, uh, it's possible for a client to make some queries and then get uh, the average representation of the, the picture of one class, which is one person. So even though um, they don't necessarily know what my face looks like, by making these queries, uh, they can get a, a rough uh, impression of what my face looks like, and that would be a violation of privacy. So that's the second uh, example. Third example would be, again, the, the uh, adversary is the client, but this time the client is interested in the model itself. Well, they want to steal the model, um, either because they they don't want to pay for this prediction service uh, provider, they want to use the model by themselves, or um, uh, quite often it's also the case that they want to steal the model because they want to find uh, uh, ways to evade the stolen model, uh, like find an adversarial example against the stolen model. And it turns out that quite often an adversarial example against the stolen model is also an adversarial example against the real model. So they might steal the model, not because they want to use the model themselves, but because they want to use that to figure out how to evade this original model. So this is a threat against model confidentiality. And again, the adversary just repeats, uh, repeatedly asks questions from the machine learning model and use that information to build a so-called surrogate model. So again, this has been shown to be practical and, and, and these uh, references in blue are, are work uh, from my students. Uh, so recently, we and other people showed that this is possible against sort of realistic, real life models, um, and 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 therefore this constitutes a, a threat because you know it's a, it's a threat for the uh, for the business advantage for the for the entity that trained the machine learning model and wants to monetize that if somebody can steal the model and bypass the the service provider altogether. So that's the third kind of uh, attack. So all of these now we looked at sort of potentially malicious clients, um, but this doesn't need to be potentially malicious clients alone. Other people can also be malicious. So before I tell you a little bit about other potential malicious actors and what they can cause, um, I want to tell a little bit more about this model confidentiality and, and attacks against model confidentiality because this is an active research area in my group. Um, so uh, quite often these are shown to be against image uh, classification models. But recently, there have also been other models. So there have been a bunch of recent papers that showed that uh, natural language processing models, like state-of-the-art natural language processing models, can also be stolen. And in fact, one of the papers, this last paper by Wallace et al., stole uh, um, uh, Google Translate and used that to find an adversarial example against Google Translate. And I'll, I'll let you stare at this for a minute so you can see what the adversarial example here is. So this is translating from English to German, and there is a first sentence which is translated as you would expect, but the second sentence is an adversarial example, and it confuses the machine learning model so that it translates it incorrectly. So it changes uh, degrees Fahrenheit to degrees centigrade, but also it gets the, the actual numbers completely wrong. 
And it, it turns out that this is still a valid uh, adversarial example. So you can go click on this link and you'll see that Google Translate is still misclassifying this. The second example of model stealing that I want to uh, tell you about, which might be interesting to you, is uh, style transfer models. So not image classification models that given an image tell what kind of object there is, but uh, models that take an image and produce another image. And these are called style transfer models, and they are typically trained using the so-called generative adversarial networks or GANs. And, and these are very popular. And, and you have probably seen examples like this Face app, which is a popular smartphone app, which given a photo can do things like age that person or make that person look younger or change the gender and so on. Uh, it has also been used for things like given a photo, it can generate uh, uh, something that looks like a painting in a particular style or given a painting, it can generate a photorealistic image that looks like a photo of that uh, same scene. And typically these work by um, uh, the, the, the victim, the, the person who is training the model has a bunch of unstyled images, but they have a bunch of source styles. So for example, in this case, this is a Monet painting. There are some examples of what Monet paintings, uh, Monet paintings look like. And then, then they used to use this kind of a generative adversarial network to train a model that given an image, uh, like a photograph, it'll turn that into a, uh, something that looks like a painting in the source style. And this is what's then available as uh, mobile phone apps and, and so on. And you can imagine that this would be interesting for an adversary to steal, right? So face app uh, can, can make a business by advertising or by selling their app. But uh, if I can steal the face app functionality, then I wouldn't need to, to do this. So this is something that my students are working on, uh, and, and in particular, they are, among other things, they have shown uh, how to steal a model that applies this Monet style. So on the left here, you see the original photographs. Um, uh, these are unstyled, and the model that's trained will generate uh, 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 paintings that look like the second column, which are the same scenes, but now they are uh, they look like paintings in uh, in uh, as if Monet would have uh, painted them. And uh, uh, the stolen model, which is the last column, you can see on the third column, and, and you can see that the second and third column are, are roughly comparable, so that the functionality can be stolen in a way that humans think that they are similar. Okay, so now uh, I, wanted, I promise that I'll tell you about uh, other potential adversaries. So think about the case where the prediction service provider is the potential adversary and what they are interested in is learning some information about the client themselves. So clients use a prediction service for a particular purpose, like say Google Translate. You use Google Translate because you want to translate some input sentence to some other language, but your input sentence may be confidential. If you are working for a company and you translate uh, you know, a contract that you're negotiating with, uh, with a, a partner in China or a partner in Korea, um, the text that you put in is potentially confidential information. Now you necessarily have to reveal this information to the machine learning model holder, which is Google, right? And, and Google may misuse this information uh, for purposes other than just translating. And this kind of problem can occur in many situations, right? So um, we started working on this uh, in the particular case of cloud assisted uh, malware scanning. Um, so this is very popular if you have a smartphone before you install an application on the smartphone, your local client, uh, antivirus client might extract some features from the app, send it to this prediction service, and the prediction service will use their model to decide if that app is potentially malicious or not. <clears throat> this is nice and it is being used, but of course if the prediction service provider itself is malicious, or if somebody breaks into this prediction service provider system, they might use this uh, information about each app not just to decide if it's uh, uh, if it's uh, a potentially malicious app, but to actually profile this user because uh, you know, the, service, the service provider can keep track of all the applications that a user has. And, uh, and people have shown that this is enough to profile a user quite extensively. So if you tell what applications you have on your smartphone, uh, an AI expert who has trained a model uh, that, that, that learns how to profile, can, can predict quite a lot about your, your gender, your income level, your hobbies, your political beliefs, your religious beliefs, and so on. So clearly this is a violation of uh, um, uh, privacy for the client. 
And, uh, and people have tried to sort of address this in different ways. The second paper that I mentioned here is a way for a client to use a cloud-based uh, uh, machine learning model um, to, for, the, for the intended prediction without actually revealing the actual input uh, or the output to the model, uh, to the entity that's running the service. So imagine that if you are able to use Google Translate to translate a sentence without Google actually, actually knowing what sentence uh, it is. And, and this can be done using hardware mechanisms or using uh, advanced uh, cryptographic mechanisms. Okay, so that's a case where the client is, is no longer the adversary, but the prediction service provider is the adversary. It could also be that the, the entity that provides this popular machine learning libraries could be an adversary. And then their goal might be that uh, write the software in such a way that later when they send a specific query, that leaks some information about the data set, right? So there'll be a handcrafted query that serves as a backdoor to reveal information about the data set. Again, this has been shown that, uh, that it's possible that uh, typically machine learning models can be made to remember quite a lot. And uh, in addition to doing their job, they can also be made to remember specific things about the, the uh, training set. And, uh, and then in response to carefully crafted queries, leak information about this, uh, the specific uh, uh, aspects of training data. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, model integrity. Uh, and then this is a case where the adversary is actually the people who are providing data for training. And quite often machine learning models use online training, so they learn data from users of the system all the time. And if a user is uh, potentially malicious, they can feed incorrect data with the goal of somehow compromising uh, uh, the machine learning model so that it ends up making wrong decisions. So this is sometimes known as poisoning. And you can imagine why poisoning might be uh, attractive to an adversary, right? So one good example is spam filters. And, and spammers used to do this uh, all the time, that they would send mail with text taken from uh, um, newspapers and books and so on. And their goal is to uh, sort of throw your machine learning model, um, um, sort of confuse your machine learning model so that uh, um, uh, it, it finds lots of normal text in messages that are classified as spam and therefore becomes less effective and, and recognizing spam. <clears throat> and, and this kind of model poisoning has also happened in other cases. This picture down below is a, a Microsoft chatbot called Tay that Microsoft introduced a few years ago. So it was supposed to be an AI based chatbot that can chat intelligently with, uh, with people and learns all the time while, they, while it chats. And within days, uh, um, I think there was like a Twitter campaign and within days people trained uh, um, uh, Tay to be sort of anti-Semitic and deny Holocaust and so on, because it learns from interactions with, uh, with uh, uh, users and malicious users can uh, uh, drive this training off filter, and which actually forced uh, Microsoft to, to uh, withdraw Tay from circulation. Um, so I, I talked about security and privacy concern. I hope I've convinced you that by systematically analyzing, asking these questions like who is the adversary, what is their interest, um, you could start with the catalog of all the security and privacy problems. And, and that's like a major first step of recognizing what the problems are. And, and there have been a number of ways of trying to address uh, these problems. And these are all active research areas and, and by no means uh, um, sort of definitive the result. But we could also ask if uh, malicious is behavior the only concern uh, and, and what other concerns are there in before you can trust an AI based system. And, and you have probably seen this uh, news articles. For example, there was uh, later last year, there was an article about how Twitter, which uh, uh, if you have a large picture in your tweet, it decides uh, what part of that picture to, um, to highlight in this kind of an image preview that you see when you see the tweet uh, initially. And, uh, and someone noticed that if, if you have a photo that contains both the, the, the US Senate Majority Leader and the former president, it always picked the Senate Majority Leader's face as the, the uh, uh, preview. There have been also other concerns about bias like this. Uh, <clears throat> people who have been using uh, AI models for predictive policing, um, researchers have shown that these tend to 
consistently discriminate against certain uh, uh, ethnic groups and, and have called for this uh, predictive policing to be um, discontinued for this reason. Um, and uh, again, sort of uh, uh, models that are used to decide whether who gets parole, uh, uh, there has been evidence that these are also um, um, make consistently wrong decisions. And these are not necessarily uh, decisions that arise because somebody is intentionally trying to fool the machine learning model, but something that's more inherent. And, uh, and in the case of this Twitter case, uh, it turns out that Twitter actually tried to be to, to even screen for problems like this and, uh, and and their testing and their measures of accuracy weren't sufficient. So, so this, this particular problem that I told you where you have an image with uh, multiple people and uh, Twitter consistently picking one person. So here is the same issue with cartoons. The actual pictures were like this, uh, but the ones that you see on the right, uh, but Twitter will always pick uh, one person as the, the uh, preview image. And when this was pointed out, Twitter responded by saying that they, they were aware of this potential bias. They did test, uh, but admitted that their tests are, uh, were inconclusive and they promised to deploy um, additional safeguards. You can still go to this, uh, this particular tweet and you will see the same effect. These two images are there, but the preview will uh, uh, pick this one person. And this is not necessarily based on skin color, but rather uh, consistently preferring one kind, uh, one type over other type. And, and it remains to be seen uh, what's causing this uh, bias and, and how to defend uh, against this. So with that, I would uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, stop. Uh, and I hope that I have sort of um, been able to persuade you that uh, AI is, uh, uh, is becoming widely deployed. Uh, but in order to trust AI-based systems, one has to think about uh, uh, potential security and privacy concerns that can be induced based on adversarial behavior in the sense that like somebody trying to actively circumvent your system. But there are also these ethical and legal concerns, and this is why I put adversarial in quotes in this, uh, um, this slide, uh, because it may not be intentionally adversarial, but because of biases in the training data or bi uh, biases that arise from the way the particular model architecture is, uh, is chosen. Um, these all affect the, the uh, end result. And, and therefore, um, um, uh, uh, people and organizations that want to use machine learning models and AI models should be uh, cognizant of this, uh, this potential problem. And uh, this is an active research area. There have been many, many uh, solutions that try to address some of these problems. Um, and but being aware of that is, is the first step of uh, being able to deal with that. Thank you, Ashokan, for a fantastic talk. Any questions, please? So would I see the questions in the Q&A? Yeah, you can. You should be able to see it. OK. Question by Paul. He says, I love this topic of trustworthy AI because it reminds me of science fiction books of my youth, especially Isaac Asimov. Is it right. time to implement the three laws of robotics? Right. Really to protect from the possible dangers of AI and robots. Right. There are also other, I mean, science fiction is always good at uh, anticipating things. You remember this minority report, which is about predictive policing, right? So stopping crimes before they happen. And uh, uh, again, those are very attractive targets for um, adversaries to to circumvent, right? So Ashokan, you talked mostly about attacks and problems. Uh, great, that's great. Uh, the question one may have then is how do you protect against some of these concerns, the security concerns, privacy concerns, and also how do you get to a point where you can claim legal compliance you know so suppose the european union says uh we can't let your products into into our marketplace because they don't they're not compliant right. uh, what do you do in then right right so um again the, the, the reason why i didn't touch those is partly because uh, of time but partly also these are active research areas and and we and you and many others have been working on this um, so, for example, uh, in the area that, that uh, my students have been working on, this model extraction, 
I think the consensus now is that uh, it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to detect and prevent uh, model extraction against a, a powerful but realistic adversary. So people have been thinking about you know, not trying to prevent them, but uh, having some kind of deterrence, right? So the, the reason for stealing a model would be to make money out of that by offering a competing service. If that happens, would you be able to demonstrate that uh, you are the owner of that model and, and therefore resort to other mechanisms? So people have tried things like um, um, uh, watermarking or fingerprinting as a way to prove ownership of a model rather than trying to prevent uh, stealing of models. Another approach is to, uh, again, perturb your model, uh, your, your data in such a way or your model outputs in such a way that uh, if somebody steals and tries to sort of build their own model, that model will not be effective. So again, the consensus is that it seems it's difficult to stop model stealing, uh, but we can try to, to work around uh, by looking at what they will do with the stolen model and try to, um, to reduce incentives. Right. You mentioned GDPR, and that's also an active. So one of the things that uh, in GDPR that I, I know you have been working on as well is this notion of right to forget, right? So mm -hmm. if people contribute data, they need to be able to assert that their data should be removed from a model. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and this is also an active research area. Like how, do, how can a model owner show that a particular user who invoked this uh, uh, right to be forgotten or right to erasure uh, uh, right, uh, whether their data is removed from the final model without having to retrain every time somebody uh, invokes this. Thank you, Ashokan, for a fantastic talk. So we'll uh, go on to the next talk now.